Now, we've all seen Joker and we all loved it. Outside of Joaquin Phoenix, the cinematography was epic. The color was unfreaking real. So get super pumped. We're going to be interviewing Jill Bogdanovich, the colorist of Joker. Is it just me? Or is it getting crazier out there? What's going on guys, this is Kazi. Welcome to another epic series. This time I'm going to be bringing on industry titans. Okay, this is not only going to be color grading related. We're gonna have some cinematographers, we're gonna have some directors, screenwriters, all of that. But in this first episode, it's going to be Jill. She's a senior colorist at Company 3, one of the biggest color grading house on planet Earth. She has worked on so much stuff. Just look at her IMDb. It just goes on for days. She worked on Joker, John Wick, the Grand Budapest Hotel, and the list goes on. Obviously, we're going to be deep diving asking her about Joker, but we will also talk about her inspirations and how does she start out and all that other good stuff, right? So this is loaded with industry information. And Jill is genuinely the kind of soul. She does not hold anything back. So this is going to be amazing. It's going to be a fun one hour long conversation. Grab a notepad. And guys, if you really want to take your color grading game to the next level, I have two free trainings. Link is in the description. Go check them out. And on that note, smash that like button. Subscribe to my channel for more awesomeness. Make sure to follow me on Instagram. Let's roll the intro. Hey, Jill, how's it going? Good, how you doing? I'm so pumped. I'm so pumped. Okay, so I sent awesome. you that little... I'm excited to be here too. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. I sent you that little screen recording yesterday and you saw all the questions and that was just one side of it. Like we have a private Facebook group and email list and I mean, it, there's just so many questions. So I just awesome. want to jump right in. Um, let's start with, I just want to start with like, you know, Baby Jill, let's just go back like where it came <laughs> from. Like, let's just start from there and uh, then we'll just dive in. All right. Well, you know, um, I'm a first of all, can you hear me? OK, yes. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. And um, yeah, I've always been an artist ever since I was little. I would paint and draw and I was always interested in photography as well. You know, so that's really my background is art. And I still do that. I still paint. I have art shows. Um, I'm still inspired by paintings and and all of that kind of thing. But I grew up on a farm in upstate New York. What? In Rochester. That is insane. And yeah. Yeah. So I grew up riding horses and painting. And, and um, you know, I have a family that was working at Kodak, my dad. And uh, he's a color scientist and he was there. I mean, he's retired now. But, uh, yeah. So that is basically how I just, I've always had a passion for art and color. And photography, I had my own dark room when I was 10 and um, wow. did my own photography with black and white and developed my own film. So that is crazy. It's, it's just, I've it's loved. in your DNA. It's in you. Um, that is yeah. insane. I mean, your dad is a legend. Like, I mean, it's intimidating. It's, it's one of those things that reading up on your dad, I'm just like, why am I even doing this? You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's so crazy. So. <laughs> Coming from that, like, how much did you take from that? And and it sounds like, to me at least, just hearing your story is that you're driven a bit more from the creative side than technical, or is it yeah. half and half? What is it? Well, I also um, studied physics as well. So I do have a technical oh side to me as well. So I really do like to figure out how things work and how things are put together, you know? Um, so being a colorist is a nice mesh, I think, of technical and creative, 100. I think. 100. And um, I remember when I was uh, 18, I came out to San Diego. I was in, living in Rochester, and I came out to San Diego with my dad to a technical meeting. I think it was ACDL at the time, and started talking to some of the industry legends about, you know, um, what kind of things I wanted to do with my life. Because I'm a painter, and I was doing physics, and I didn't know which way to go. And I said, wow, that sounds like something, sounds like you'd be a really good at a color, to be a colorist. I said, well, what's that? Right. You know, at the time, I didn't really have any idea. And uh, we went back to Rochester and Rochester had in Kodak had a R&D lab with one colorist, one engineer, and there was an internship open to work there. And um, I applied. I got the internship. 
And what they were doing was moving the telecine bay from one building to another. So they need they needed an intern to pull wires, to cable the place, <laughs> to it. learn how to run all the machines. Um, I had an old rank telecine. I learned how to run that with a pogo. I learned how to run the Avid. I learned um, the old DaVinci 888 with the Spirit. I did all these R and D tests on film versus video, so it was a really insane, amazing background yeah. to be able to learn all that. Back in that, in those days, it was like what that was probably like ninety seven to ninety nine. You know, I did that kind of stuff. So I mean, the, and, while I was finishing, the, yeah, the crazy, and I came out here. The crazy thing is that don't you think? Like, so in your case, like for coming from that kind of background, it's insane. Like it's absolutely nuts. So. Do you think that, I mean, I wouldn't go as far as like it's a necessity, but even in this day and age, do you think it's necessary to kind of deep dive and just, you know, learn the roots, like come up from there? Or is it okay to kind of just how things are nowadays where you can just pick up, pick a learning platform like online or something like that, and then just jump right in and make a video that goes viral on Vimeo and then you blow up and you work on some stuff. So what's your take on what's happening and well, how you come up? Sure. I mean, uh, I was very fortunate and I was in the right place at the right time. And I mean, this is, we're talking over 20 years ago, right? right? So I've been doing this for a long time. Um, I think my take on that is I'm always proponent of having as much knowledge as possible. And I'm working with some of the biggest and most amazing artists, uh, directors, cinematographers. Right. I'm so blessed to be able to work with these people. And I learn something every show, you know, I learned everything. I learn every, every time I do a movie. And um, I try to take as much as I possibly can to learn about them. So learn about photography background, learn about lenses, learn about different cameras, um, how they light on set, how I can best make that shine, you know, how right. to recognize what they were trying to protect for, you know, having more knowledge is always amazing because I'd say right now with a lot of the stuff you can learn online and all the technical stuff is incredible. That type right. of network that we have now. I never had that. I had to read the manuals. Like I didn't, couldn't ask people. Right. So I had to figure out a lot out, but, um, you know, that network is incredibly powerful, but also that's like one piece of the puzzle. The rest of the puzzle is learning the aesthetic, learning the history, learning the elegance of the craft, right. Mm -hmm. And understanding why cinematographer may be doing something a certain way, or the director may Put the camera here rather than there or right. you know there's a lot to the craft of course and i respect that and every every time i'm working with somebody i like to figure out okay well why would you do this or that or oh i see that this is done a certain way well, that let's you know make sure we enhance that and i think just having the knowledge of the art and the craft that a lot of it comes with experience a lot of it can come from studying fine art fine art paintings yeah. can be, um, which is my background also, right? So fine art paintings, fine art photography, all of that is really all the same language. I love right? it. Learning that language is a huge part of what I do. I love that because, you know, even what, you know, on paper, you're a colorist, but there's so much more jack of all trades, you know, in, in a sense, mm -hmm. like, and, and all of it comes together. And that's one of the things that I feel like we're, we're kind of headed in that direction, even in the filmmaking field too. Like in 2012, 2010, it was more like, hey, stick to one thing and don't tell people that you're also a cinematographer. Like just stick with editing, stick with color. That's your thing if you want to be taken seriously. And what you're right. saying, I feel like as this gets out more and people hear it from, you know, people like you, then they're going to realize that, okay, this is not such a bad thing that I also like this and I like that. Like I can actually blend the two, bring them together. You know, that's a big thing. Absolutely. It's a huge strength. You know, the more, you know, it's always, it's like the simple, simple thing that we learned during your kids, right? The more right. that, you know, knowledge is power. So the more you can understand and know about different, um, different crafts, cinematography, colorist, uh, directing, writing, all of those things, finding where, uh, in the story that you can help you know, help tell the story as right. a colorist, you know, and be part of the collaboration. That's the inspiring stuff. Exactly. Joe, let's get into the favorite thing that ever happened to me last year, Joker. And uh, <laughs> okay, so. Are you a fan? <laughs> oh my God. So, I mean, I'm a fan to a point where the, I invited a friend at a party and he came and he said he's never seen Joker. And first I asked him politely to leave and then he wouldn't leave. And <laughs> 
on his birthday, I actually bought him Joker on iTunes and I'm like, go watch it. Like right now. Just oh, watch that's it. amazing. So that's I, I, I'm that serious. Um, so <laughs> I think what I want to do is more than, you know, just like generally talking about it, let's just kind of get into the specifics and let's start with at what part of the process do you get involved? You know, yeah. um, so let's start there. And then I have a couple of more questions and I'll ask. Yeah, yeah, no problem. No problem. Sounds good. So yeah, for this one, I've worked with a cinematographer, Larry Shear, for a long time. Um, we collaborated, collaborated on a lot of movies and Todd as well, Todd Phillips, a director. So I was involved from the very beginning. Um, and that's the way I love to do it, it, be able to just get in the beginning. And I feel like it's a great communication tool because I can, I do make different look of tables per show. Every show I make my own um, and give that to the cinematographer on set. And the director That's and important. we'll do, yeah, like a hair and makeup test. Right. And then we'll kind of experiment with a few different ones, different lookup tables and different CDLs that we'll pair with the lookup table and uh, find a pairing or find different ways for the workflow to make it like really what, what they want. So I, that's what I did for Joker. Um, they shot a test with film and a couple other cameras and really wanted it to be filmic. So uh, we, what we did is I, we created a lookup table, Company 3. My color scientist at Company 3 helped along with my dad, actually. My, my father, Mitch, I called him up, said, hey, um, I would love to have a lookup table that um, basically emulates a film stock from early 80s. And uh, what can you show me? What can you give me? So he gave me a couple different stocks. 93 was one of them. And um, that's what we ended up using is, is that lookup table. And so that is sort of like a standard procedure working on feature films. Like you'll create a lookup table and then the DP will take that and kind of see it on set, what it's going to be like somewhat in the ballpark. And then it comes back to you and go from there. Yeah. I mean, um, I'm open to, I do that a lot with people that I work with a lot. I'm totally open to not doing that as well. So the cinematographer just has a lot that they love. Right. They want to use that. I'm cool with that. Whatever works best. But I do do that often um, from the TV series I do as well. Like I work with Michael Fimiari, uh consistently. And, um, you know, before this whole pandemic hit, I was up in Vancouver and set up a new lot for his show, from his new Netflix show they, they were shooting up there. Of course, I'm paused now. But, um, you know, I do do it for pretty much every project now. So for Joker, like, was there a specific color space that you guys used or are you... Like, is it ASUS? Is it something else that you guys start off with and then branch it off to like whatever the deliverables are? Yeah. I mean, every movie's different. For Joker, we didn't work in ASUS. Um, we can. There's a lot of shows I do work in ASUS. So to me, it doesn't matter either way. Um, whatever is best for the show, you know. But for Joker, it's basically I was involved and in, made the lookup table and some CDLs early on to be able to make sure that everything um, looked the way they wanted and helped supervise dailies for the first few weeks to get them rolling. And um, then by and then that way, the visual effects team also has a very accurate representation of what the movie is going to look like based on the CDLs and the lookup table for the show. And uh, then by the time I get it, it's already in a place of familiarity, right? Like it's right. a great communication tool for everybody in all different stages. And so then they already kind of know when they get into me, oh, you know, this scene worked or this didn't work or let's fine tune here or there so larry and i could really work on details right um and then talk to come in as well of course and do detail so you know the the actual grading process when you get it like in it's in finishing how much time on a movie like joker like what, what's the time frame how long would it take to color it and then two, yeah. two part question and then how much are you working by yourself then when you have a dp or director in the room with you Got it. So that's question. I, I get every movie is different, but um, going back to Joker, Joker, I think we had um, a little over like a, about a month to really month, month and a half. I, you know, it, there was a couple Incredible. of points where we're just waiting for some visual effects to come in or waiting for a couple of different other little elements to come in, you know, so or titling and that kind of thing. We wait for we'll like, you know, get to a point where we're really strong and then kind of like stop down for a little few hours and pick it back up. So Basically, a pretty solid month would be a good four, maybe five weeks um, is pretty normal for a good big size show. There's some movies that I'll do a solid month and a half or two months, right. you know, the bigger ones that have heavier visual effects um, because, you know, 
We, I also will run the visual effects reviews to be able to make sure that, you know, on the big screen, they're seeing what they want to see. And maybe they'll give me notes to things that can enhance the visual effects shot uh, for the final movie and that type of thing. So, you know, um, all of that, it, it really varies the time that I get. But in general, four or five weeks for a big show. I, two weeks is standard for like a smaller show. Um, and, uh, then TV series are a different animal. You know, you have, depends on the speed and the, um, budget of the show. So we, I kind of work with whatever the budget and the timeline is. And I do indies too, as well. Now for something like, I mean, you know, the thing about Joker that, you know, just draws me in so much is that when I look at your work and, and even Dr. Sleep, when I look at your work, there's something about like, there's something unapologetic about it. It's like, you know, it, it screams like it has a style, you know, but it doesn't like kind of, you know, take you away from the story. If anything, it really puts you in like how my wife just says, she's like, when I watch Joker, like she's not even a colorist and she's like, it just puts me in that nostalgic space. Like I'm in New York, like I'm there, you know, like it just, I go there. So, you know, when I see Joker, I see that, yes, it has the characteristics of a film look, but it still looks like and feels like it's done in 2020. So that's very different than like, you know, something like Machete or something like that, where they're actually creating a film look and then it looks like that, you know, uh, like a period yeah. piece. So yeah. pushing like, you know, people and so many people ask, like, you know, how does she pull these colors? And there's so much separation in the colors and there's no color yeah. noise. And it's like it all lives in the right place, like nothing. You can just go frame by frame and there's just it's perfection. So, I mean, I don't need you to get super technical into it, but is there like is there like a Jill sauce that's going on <laughs> any of these things? What's happening here? <laughs> Well, it's, to be honest, it's really my aesthetic. And I feel like I just make it feel, you know, when I'm painting, like I'll, to relate it to, to just tactile paint, right? When I'm painting, I really will use the colors or the separation of colors to help draw the eye where I want. And I do the very similar things when, when I'm coloring, right? Like I just get to a feel and it's, it's hard to, for me to even explain it. Cause I just kind of do it. It's just like, you, you know, you, you, get a certain feel and then you're like, Oh yeah, but clicks in that feels right. You know, you know, when you're going through and you're finding an image and there's so many, as you know, infinite number of decisions you have to make when you're coloring. Right. And there's so many different tools, right. And there's so many different ways to get to it. So when I'm creating a lookup table, there's certain things I, I always make sure that I give myself a good color depth. So I don't basically, uh, there's more, intricate ways to do it, but the saturation, I don't desaturate usually unless I pick certain colors to desaturate in the lookup table. Um, and then as I go through and in color shot to shot, which of course that's a lot of work as well, the shot to shot coloring, I just go through and will, um, use certain keys. Sometimes it's keys. Sometimes it's power window shaping, like old school dodging and burning yeah. and photography, which Love does it. a lot guide the eye. Some, I keep it as simple as I can and as elegant as I can um, to be able to keep that consistent feel. And I just go through it. And back to your question, I don't think I answered is how often am I supervised versus unsupervised, right? Um, if there's a big, there's a trust going on with me and the director and cinematographer, you know, and if I've been involved since, since the very beginning, they'll let me go through and do my first pass, you know, go through, smooth it out. Mm -hmm. uh, bring it to a point where we can have more constructive conversations, more detailed conversation. And, um, I have, I worked with a cinematographer named Tom Stern for a long time and he used to call it the closing circle of excellence, right? Love it. <laughs> so Love you start it. big and you kind of spiral down to the details. So I always loved that, that he, he had a very elegant Truth. way of, of, of describing it. Right. So, you know, uh, as far as like the color separation, sometimes it's keys, Sometimes it's finding certain things that, um, that I love in the, in the, um, production design or the costuming that I really bring up or I'll swing a color's hue to be able to fit more in the palette. I did a lot of that in, um, in Joker cause there, you know, I wanted it to all kind of feel like, you know, the cyans and the yeah. greens really let them sing throughout and, and the golds to accent it, you know, um, love it. and yeah. And, and not necessarily with contrast always, you know, because 
uh, a very filmic feel is to be able to feel into the shadows and feel into the highlights, but Mm -hmm. not have it be flat. So there's always finding that balance too. So it's just kind of getting the groove of every movie. I always start, when I start a movie, it's really great for me to start and when I'm pre-timing, I always say it's kind of exploring the photography, exploring the movie. Each movie has its own uh, voice and its own story. So I always, as I'm going through pre-timing, I'm looking for that. I'm finding things that tie it all together to yep. be able to help, you know, make it feel like a flow. That's insane. Um, I want to yeah. get into, I want to ask you about a movie like John Wick. You came on on yeah. part two and three, right? So, yeah. yep. I mean, to me, anytime I jumped on a project, I'm an editor and a colorist. Anytime I jump on a project that's already been established, sometimes it's harder to work on that because you, you're like, I got to untangle it and then get in there. But, you know, things are done differently on Hollywood level. So I want to ask you, going from John Wick to John 2, not only the colorist changed, but the DP changed. But yeah. the story needs to stay the same and the, everything has to come together. So are you given like, Hey, here's the DaVinci Resolve project file from, you know, John Wick one to two. Is it that, or is it like you have to recreate it? How does that go? That's a good question. Um, In that case, between John Wick one and John Wick two, John Wick, I talked to the director, Chad, about that. Um, Chad, he was one of the directors on the first one. So he was also the sole director on the second. And Dan Lauston, he brought in, of course, as a cinematographer. And I talked to them about that when I got onto the movie. And Basically, since John Wick 1 was a story introducing you to his whole world, right? Um, The second one was even more heightened, even a little bit more surreal. Like The whole movie is is very, same with third one. It's it's a very surreal world he lives in, right? Right. And so we were able to heighten that movie with a look even more. And so, yeah, no, I had no reference, nor did I, was I really... um, directed to have a huge reference for the first one, even though I watched it and I was very aware of it and everything. Um, it was beautifully done. But the second one, we were allowed to depart from that because the story departed from that, you know, and we were allowed to uh, give it a stronger look. Again, that's that's got a lot of poppy color to it, right? And that's it's shot awesome. that way with a lot of color separation and a lot of different beautiful, beautiful locations. Right. And um, so we just let those sing and let them heighten them all to that surreal place. No, it's so crazy. Like, I mean, there's, I mean, some images up here, oh, like yeah, it yeah. is so insane. <laughs> like, I'm like, how does. Oh, in that particular shot, actually, um, those green windows. So we added a lot of color to New York. So those windows that were up there were not that green fluorescent light. And um, we added the blue, some of the um, cyan that's in the windshield reflection. We added some of that in. The warmth on the pavement next to the guy on the ground, we added some of that. So there's a lot of painting that went into these things to be able to give it subtle. We'd find elements like like those windows that right. kind of look boring and white. Yeah. Like, why do I want boring white windows in the frame? Like, That's- let's make them cool. Like, let's make this super cool. So we made them that cool, that interesting green. And, and it always kind of popped up anytime we had the purples or the magentas. Let those sing a little bit because it's kind of, again, that's a a color that is a little surreal, you right. know, and, and to kind of mix that with a green fluorescence, which are kind of dirty. And then the really super clean poppy purple magenta is just really fun, right. you know, energetic. We kept a lot of energy going in the, in the color along with the, the movie. Actually. No, you see that. And, and is that the old school windowing or is it hue versus hue or what's happening here? Or is- That's old school windowing um, in this particular case. That one is literally, I drew windows around and keys. Sometimes I do the key inside the windows, you know, but um, I keep it pretty simple with with that kind of thing usually. And because again, there's a lot of movement as well. Right. So I have to keep it super clean because these things get blown up. I think like, you know, it's on a 90 foot screen somewhere. 100, yeah. I have to make sure there's no key edges or anything. No, it's so freaking beautiful. I mean, look at this one. Like these are just crazy. Like these frames are insane. Um. I want to talk to you about beautiful photography. Dan killed it. He freaking killed it. It just looks so beautiful. Um, I want to get into the haunting of Hill House. I mean, one horror is like my one of my favorite genres, like growing up, like it was just the best thing. Um, And the way this one is done, you know that it's so different, right? Look wise. I mean, because uh, usually you just think of let me I. 
am still a grandpa with these things. I don't know how to hide the picture. We'll just leave it there. <laughs> Nobody needs to see my face. Um, okay, so the haunting of Hill House, it has cert- such a unique look because it's almost like what happens sometimes like in, in uh, uh, Deacon's stuff, you know? So think of like uh, Sicario and like night scenes. And it's almost like you're just kind of like that. You're like, wait, what's happening? You know, or or it also reminds me of the episode three of the last season of Game of Thrones, you know, the big battle sequence, which everybody complained about because they're just like, we can't see anything. And I'm just like, get a better TV, you know, like it just, yeah. it's, it's all there. <laughs> so that's how I felt when I was watching the the Haunting of Hill House, because I'm just like, oh my God, like I see it, you know, I'm seeing what you're doing, what's happening. And I'm like, I love it. Like where I kind of have to just almost like move around to see things. So yeah. how much of that is Jill? Or is it the DP director like went in telling you that, hey, this is what we're looking for? Well, um, that's those are the guys I work with these guys a lot. A lot. Mike Flanagan and Mike Feminari, they're awesome. They're amazing. And again, for that series, I actually went on set and went down to uh, Atlanta and um, created look of tables on set just during while we were live, had a resolve and just made sure that what they were looking at, you know, what we could create the look on an actual test piece of the set with all different textures and lamps and, you know, wallpaper, because the whole show is taking place in a dark haunted house, right? you know? And the whole thing is almost like you should be in this dark haunted house. That's got, you know, soft, dark light. Like there shouldn't, you shouldn't feel it's too sourcey. You just right. want to be able to see into the dark. It's like you turn off the lights and your eyes adjust and all of a sudden you see Love in your it. room, but it's all very, you know, you don't see a source of light. It's just kind of your eyes adjust. And that that was kind of the feeling that we were going to go for on that. And, um, and then I kind of really limited the palette on that one severely, like not just desaturation only, but created a bit of cyan in the blacks and yellow in the highlights. So it created a little bit of a color twist. Right. But also had to be able to, to keep that red door, which is a character really in, in the series, keep that red door strong. So um, I had to do some clever stuff because really cyan and the blacks with the Z2 cancels the red. Yep, so yep, exactly. there are certain things I had to do to be able to retain that red in an elegant way, keep it pure and clean without being noisy. And um, so uh, I had to get a little clever with that, but that worked really beautifully. And um, it's a, I, I'm very proud of that look as well because it's, it is like a, a very, it's got a very strong point of view. You know, is, it's yeah, not 100. supposed to be a super, clean right. look at the scopes of blacks or blacks or whites or white it's yep. supposed to have a kind of a dissonant feel to it you know no that's exactly so i mean this is this is what i mean when i look at like even going back to like looking at war dogs like i mean i'm looking at your stuff and i'm like man she just she just goes for it that's where the unapologetic like word comes to mind where you're just like yeah this is what's going to happen and you're going to take it. Like, I mean, and then just, (laughs) they're just like, we're happy. This looks great. (laughs) You know, Um, I want to, okay. So, so let's talk about that then, because, you know, you go into my gallery stills in black or in DaVinci Resolve and it's filled with like, there's a folder called Jill and then there's a bunch of looks, you know? So like, I'm (laughs) like, we're going to inspiration to you. Right. So, I mean, so many of us are going to inspiration for you. Who do you turn to Thank you or that, what yeah. do you turn to? Yeah, for me, um, it's true. I actually really love all different types of paintings and art. And I'm always searching for different artists and different things that, that inspire me. And um, so I used to go to art galleries all the time. Right now, obviously, I'm calm. But, you know, looking through my art books and searching the Internet for new upcoming artists or different, you know, new takes on how people see things, new photographers. Like I've got so many people that just inspire me. I find images and I have a little library of images on my iPad too, things that inspire me. And then I'll um, go, I paint, obviously I have an art studio here. So uh, I'll paint a painting that inspires me from, that I was inspired by some image with different colors that were really interesting to me or, um, or a story that I read or something like that. So I, I really love just finding inspiration in different people. And I find inspiration from every project I work on as well. So certain color palettes, like I remember working with Maddie Libatique early on. Um, we did, I did some of his Spike Lee movies and uh, we found a really strong look for, for those. I think one of them was Never Die Alone. And that was super early 
yeah. in in the di game it's like early it's right. 2000 i want to say four somewhere yeah, around there super early um and that that kind of stuff those palettes that we came up with and i think he shot that on 16 if i'm if i'm not wrong but you know finding really interesting palettes and just pushing it and being unapologetic being right. bold with choices you know that that again support the story and don't take you out of the don't right. take you out of the the um flow of the movie right but i mean that, I'm inspired and I'm inspired by cinematographers I work with and, um, you know, directors I work with, like all the different ideas and the lookbooks that they bring me or the scripts that they'll, I, I read scripts a lot. People will send me the scripts of a show so I can weigh in and give ideas about, Oh wait, you know, I was thinking like this would be really interesting or that, or I like Michael Feminiari sent me lookbook and inspiration for to all the boys I've loved to all the boys I've loved before, which is I did on Netflix. Um, and, that also has a pretty strong look for a very kind of like a teenage love story type of thing. Right. It's, right. it's a beautiful story. It's adorable. And um, we are allowed to go with a pretty strong look for it, which was, it supports the story, right. you know, super colored poppy, but again, we limited it, make it elegant. And uh, so I'm always inspired by just finding different images constantly. I mean that like, it's really, really cool to know because, uh, I personally, I can't speak for other people, but I mean, most of the time, like I'm kind of going to, I'm picking, I have certain people that I'm following or, or certain movies or shows that I like, but I don't really yeah. usually get out of that realm and look at like how you're talking about, like, you know, I was inspired back in the day by Caravaggio and like, you know, his paintings and yeah. that kind of like contrast. I loved it. Um, but, you know, cause I have a cinematography background too, but it's like, that also helps me as a colorist. And I feel like that those things kind of go hand in hand too, but just like Absolutely. hearing it, like from your perspective to, to be a painter and you bringing that in that then I think that's what explains like how your color palettes and your looks just have like a different, it's a signature, you know, it's a style. And I feel right. like it's coming from something that's more than you just getting inspired by, you know, Blade Runner. And then like, how can I incorporate that into my work, which is by the way, amazing. Um, oh, <laughs> um I want, so let's talk about you know 153 plus like credits on imdb i mean you've worked on anything and everything under the sun so like you know i'm yeah. gonna ask you the hard question like give me three favorite projects that, like looks know, that some, awesome. something that you've created that you just go yes you know i'm proud <laughs> of myself you know i'm proud of this one Right. I know it's hard. It's like, it's like picking a favorite child, but, um, <laughs> because every exactly. movie has got its own, uh, you know, evolution, its own story. And, but I really do. I mean, obviously Joker was an amazing one. Um, I'm very proud of that one. I was really proud to be able to work with my dad, which is also special. Um, and Grand Budapest, it's the same thing We're working with Wes Anderson. He's a legend as well. Um, and he's super collaborative and creative. And my father made the lookup tables for that show as well. Um, so good. For me. And uh, so those those two for sure. I mean, and John Wick is, again, I love working with that team. Like Chad is brilliant. And he has got, his vision is, is pretty amazing. He's super, super smart with how he does everything. And Dan is brilliant. So those guys, those are just the three that I know that you've mentioned. But then going back a little ways, I'm still very, very proud of the movie I did called Ray. Um, oh, Ray Charles yeah. story with Taylor yeah. Hackford. That again was early, right. early DI days. Early, yeah. And I look back at how much work that was. And, um, you know, at the time, how, how we were really pushing around the bleeding edge, really, yeah. of, of some of the technology and some of the looks and things. Like, I'm still really proud of that one for sure. And, um, you know, uh, what else? I'm working with Clint Eastwood. One of my favorite ones with Clint. I did uh, Flags of Our Fathers and Letters mm -hmm. from Fukushima yeah. with, with Clint. Great and looks. Thompson. Great looks. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> and um, and Changeling was another one that I loved doing. Changeling was was really a strong, beautiful look. I, I was really proud of that one too. So there's start looking back at at all of these things. I just remember how they evolved and what I learned from each one and um, and the people, you know, we all become, we're such a small knit, tight knit group and, and friends really, right. you know, making friends with all these people. It's pretty incredible. So, I mean, all of those movies, I've, Shelly Johnson's incredible, you know, working with him on Wolfman, that was so inspiring to be able to 
create a look with Shelly, you know, right. and, um, and, and create, we did the, in Wolfman, we defocused the blacks to give it like a silky velvet feel. Oh. And, um, but if you look, if you watch the movie, you've got people clothed in black layers, like different black textures, black lapels with black lace or whatever. So we couldn't just overall defocus the black. So right. it was almost like a roto kind of situation, keeping the, keeping the blacks um, on the characters closer to camera in focus and letting everything else or certain, certain other things go, but just in the blacks. And it was, it came out so painterly and I'm really proud of that one too. That's amazing. That technique just sounds yeah. like a rocket science. That's, that's what, fun. that's crazy. Um, so yeah. this, this is a question from my wife. I got to ask you this. So she, she goes, is she ever starstruck? Like, have you ever met, like, do you meet Joaquin Phoenix? Does he come in when you're grading? Like, <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Well, um, you know, it's funny because I, Joaquin never came in. Um, you know, Todd really, uh, came in all the time. Larry, I never met him, but I've worked with Keanu. I worked with Hell Keanu, yeah. comes in, you know, <laughs> and Keanu is awesome. Um, you know, I was in his documentary side by side that he did. It's great. Um, I saw it, back, it is, yeah. which is, I think incredible. If, yeah. if you guys have seen side by side, you need to 100. find it. Yep. It's super informative. But um, he's really awesome. He'll come in and hang out with us in the DI Bay. And first time I met him, I, I was a little starstruck, <laughs> of course. Of I'm course. Too. Yeah. <laughs> and, and Clint Eastwood as well, like when I first met Clint, you know. But Clint was, he's both Keanu and Clint, anybody that I've met that's been super famous, has been nothing but down to earth, humble, and just wonderful people that I have just feel blessed to have worked with. Man, so, yeah. I would be so scared <laughs> of Clint. I just, I would yeah. stop. Like, I just can't talk around him. Um, let's do a 80 20 rule and let's talk about if I were to take, like, you know, technical skills and creativity, where do you put them? Like, oh man, that's quick. I always say, you know, it's funny. I'll add another element to that. I always say that my part of my job is psychologist as well, because you have to collaborate with some, some people who have very strong, passionate True. ideas, right? You know, so you've got the director and you've got the cinematographer. In some cases, you have the visual effects supervisor, which, of course, is there. You have to protect the visual effects and you've got the studio or whatever. So part of my job is to keep that balance, right? Mm -hmm. Make sure everybody gets what they need and want and, and make it look good. And also, at the same time, make sure that what I, what I put on the screen, I stand behind, right? Right. So I always say part of it is a little bit of psychology and making sure that everybody and, and just you know, being confident in what I do, knowing that what I put out there is good. And then it's just can, you know, be finessed in some which way to make sure that everybody gets what they need to see eyes or to see a lapel or whatever, you know? Right. So not only is it creative and technical because you have to know those things to be able to basically, it's like playing a piano, right? You learn all the technicalities of playing a piano, but then you don't think about it. You just do it. play. And it's Love very it. much like that as a colorist. Mm -hmm. So being at the forefront, you know, um, like of this industry, where do you see like the future of color grading? And especially with like, I mean, I don't know if it was like that always, but like everybody is just always talking about ASUS and what about HDR and what about Rec 2020? Has it always been like different color spaces floating around, blah, blah, blah? Or is it like a HDR? Is it like a 4K thing? Oh man, there's like, it's, it's always been changing technology. That's one of the exciting things about this job, right? So I always have to keep up with the different color spaces, the different software, the different, um, you know, whatever, like right. there's always something new to learn. Right? right. And that's kind of the fun part, the exciting part. So yeah, I've got, luckily I also have a really strong team at company three that keeps me in the loop. Cause I, when I'm being creative and I'm doing my movies or shows or whatever, I don't always have time to research other right. stuff that's going on, but we have regular meetings and talks and we have a really strong knit group at company three as colorists. We all talk a lot and, um, you know, Hey, we, oh, I just did this. I saw this. It worked really well. Oh, cool. I can try that too. Or if I have a question about awesome. something, whatever, like we have a really tight knit, um, community, which is pretty awesome, um, with that kind of stuff. But yeah, it's always been, changing, changing technology in the early days, you know, everything was shot on film when I started DI. Right. 
right? right. And when it started switching over to the different cameras, I had to know about what kind of cameras were people were shooting on. There was like the Viper camera. I don't know if you guys remember yeah. that, Viper. And there's, of course, the Red. And then when Airy came out with the Alexa, they could, you had to kind of always do tests and know what kind of stuff was working or not or how to approach a show shot on different cameras or workflow. So, yeah, I mean, every show is different. It's constantly changing. It's a moving target. And that's why it's really important to have a strong support staff. Like I have an amazing assistance. I have amazing technical group at company three. So it's just really important to be able to, to have that community to keep up on all this stuff. So one thing that I want to ask you, you know, going off of what you just said, like, you know, you don't always have the time. So maybe it depends on project to project, but you know, for you, the kind of caliber of like work that you're doing and projects that you're working on is, is do you have any play time to figure, figure things out? Or when you get those four to five weeks, you just like, it's a go time. Like you just have to go. Well, that's why actually it depends again on the show, but a lot of time, if I get involved before they shoot and I create a lookup table, so I already know the vibe, then, then I don't need as much time in the final. Right. So I can, watch a rough cut on, of the edit and have conversations with the DP or director and just make sure, okay, cool. Like this worked, this didn't work noted. And then I can go through and attack that and kind of get that feel going. And I don't need to necessarily, um, you know, start over or start from nothing. You know, I also have a strong team of pre-colorists so I can set looks and then they can kind of go through smooth stuff out. And then I come in and do more of the heavy lifting creative stuff. So, so it depends on how busy I am. You know, if I'm really busy working on a bunch of stuff, then, then I'll just, you know, uh, be able to come in and just establish the look, make sure it's all good throughout shooting. And then I come in at the end and I can just fine tune. Um, yeah. that's amazing. I mean, that makes sense. And yeah. I mean, the timeline that you guys are given is just ridiculous. So that, that does make sense. Um, yeah. Do you have like a bias toward like which camera you love the most, like one of your favorite cameras to work with, easier, whatever. Well, yeah. I mean, it always, it's, I always throw in the caveat. It depends on how it's shot, right? Um, but uh, the Alexa, some of my favorite color science because it gives me that beautiful color depth. And honestly, most of my shows are shot on some sort of Alexa. So I love Alexa, um, but I've been doing stuff on the Sony Venice as well. Um, you know, I've done a couple of shows on the new DXL. So we can get beautiful images out of all of them, really. They just right. keep like competing with one another, getting better and better. So it makes my job better, my job easier. Exactly. <laughs> to make them look good. Now, your sister is a colorist. Yeah. And she's yes, a, she is. She's awesome. And she's a trader Atlanta because Iron. she uses uh, base light, right? Yes, she does. She uses base light. I mean, <laughs> I run base light as well. Um, I've done a couple, I've done some stuff on base light. I did a uh, TV series, Bloodline, the third season on. Base light and Ghostbusters. That's beautiful. Movie. Bloodline is beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was a really beautiful one. That was fun to walk to do. But um, yeah, so I run base light as well, but I prefer for me personally, everybody has a tool of choice. For me, it's a tool and I like the resolve better. My sister runs resolve as well. And she also knows base light and she's on base light. Yep. But yeah. Um <clears throat> one of the things, and I think it comes from experience, but a lot of people can benefit from it, like so many times people just ask like, Hey, how do you develop a taste? Like, what is that colorist eye? Like, and let's just go back to that. When you were breaking down that one frame from John Wick and you're saying, I warm this up and I, you know, change the cue here and I pop the purples and like pinks and all that. So do you have like, is it something like people who are starting out that you can just maybe direct them somewhere or just give them that one piece of advice, like that Eureka thing for them? Like, is there anything like that? Well, I mean, for me, I'm, I always, I'm always evolving and I'm always, um, you know, learning and being inspired. I, I would just say keep being inspired, but also a big part of being a colorist like that and finding your style or, or whatever is being allowed to explore that. And I have had the benefit of working with some amazing creatives like Larry Shear and Shelley Johnson and Dan Lauston, who are all artists and 100. I can see where they're coming from. And then I can also learn and then say, Oh, you know, this consistently works. This is something that I always go back to, you know, this, whatever quality it may be. This is something that I really like. And I kind of will pitch it on different shows if, if it works, you know, and say, Hey, what about this? You know, I really mm -hmm. think this looks cool. And then kind of refine it for the show. But 
so I guess finding your patterns, finding what you like, finding what um, you tend to be inspired or attracted to certain qualities, you know, and then recognizing that and, and, and exploring all different versions. Like, oh, that to makes me, sense. You know, yeah, that's how I've kind of designed my, my look, you know. I oh, love it. Makes sense. Um, being at company three and a senior, senior colorist, like, you know, a, as much as I can see that, you know, it could be a boost, like where you're just like, okay, I do. And it goes, but at the same time, there's gotta be some set of like pressure to like, I don't know necessarily living up to that because you're already there, but are there times when you kind of get in your head and you're just like, oh man, like, you know, this is like, I got to keep up or like, do you ever, ever have those moments or are you just dialed and you, you got it figured out? No, man. I mean, I'm human too. Like they're always, you know, we all have doubts, right? Especially artists. I think we all have doubts of what we're creating sometimes, you know, and um, especially if there's any kind of controversy around it or somebody doesn't like something or, you know, because it's still a very subjective art, you know, when you're working with some, a lot of different pieces, a lot of different moving parts in when you're working on a movie, right? So you've got people who are tired or stressed or are dealing with something somewhere else or, you know, who knows what could be going on. Then I also, you know, can, I feel all of that as well, you know, and I want to make sure I want to always do my best to make everybody, uh, you know, make the best for the story, best for the movie. So in those situations, sure, man, I get, I get inside my head a little bit and, and have doubts every now and then, but that's when I kind of bring myself back and just like, you know, totally go do my yoga or yeah. like, you know, take a run to the dog or, you know, go see what my kids have been doing, you know, and, you know, just kind of remove myself and just remember to stay grounded. And, you know, I think that's all anybody can really do. And then get, be inspired again, go and find different images or even I'll look up old images from stuff I've done before. I'm like, oh, that was a really cool idea. Maybe I'll bring that back in for this next show or, you know, and just start focusing on positive stuff if, if anything like that happens for sure. Because wow. it happens to all of us, I think. You're way less conceited than me. Sometimes like when I'm in that mode, I just have to go back and look at my best work and I'm like, man, I got it. I got it. Let's go back in. <laughs> I can do this. Um, okay, so grading approaches. I wanna, I wanna ask you, so do you also work on commercials? Or is it just long yeah. form? Okay, so. Is, no, I do commercials as well, for sure. Is the process different for, let's say, working on 40 shots in a day for a 30 second, you know, spot compared to a, a long form? Like, is it is it one has like 32 no tree, you know, grade and one has four no tree grade? Like, is, is that a thing? Uh, yeah, I mean, it depends totally because when you start to get into commercials and product and that type of thing, it does have a lot more sometimes a detail where you don't want that shine over here and you do want this and let's fine tune, you know, the tree or whatever, because you're dealing with such short shots, you know, you need to focus the attention quickly to where you, to product or the story. So there usually are more windows and more like a heavier no tree on a, on, on a commercial because of that mainly. And, um, but you know, I've done some movies where, you know, working with West with Wes Anderson on Grand Budapest, we had, shots that had 50 60 70 nodes you know very fine detailed okay. things <laughs> so you know uh it really just depends on on how detailed and how much time you have and for a commercial you know really if you look at it you know it's one day usually i work on commercial but um you know a lot of the shots either are repeated or whatever so i can kind of take those same gradings and start there and just keep refining and then you know, since we have a lot of voices in the room, they're all looking at very, very small details. Uh, we can just basically each note from each person. I keep in the same no in the one node and then I kind of know where, you know, where I am. So, yeah. This so is so amazing to TV know. Again, animal as well. I'm so glad that you're saying this and, and everybody, you better be listening because so many times I'll freaking do a 12 node grade and everybody's like, in, like that's wrong because you can't do that on a movie. You're working on a movie with thousand shots, blah, blah, blah. There's not going to be enough time. Usually like Stefan does like grades that only has two nodes. And I'm like, where are you getting all this information from? Like what is going on? <laughs> so I'm so glad that you're, you're saying this. Um, yeah. Well, there's some shows that I've done that I only do have two nodes in one show or one or two nodes on a movie. Cause I do try to keep it simple, you know, but, um, and it depends on the speed too. If I have to do an indie movie in like three days, It'll probably have one or two notes, you know, but, um, 
but you never know. Like there's always some, some shots that maybe need a little bit more work. Right. right? Totally, totally subjective and depending on the, the budget and time. Okay. There's uh, this question that I think first I'm going to answer for you and then I'll let you answer it. So the question is, okay. Will Jill ever be doing a master class? And I say she won't be doing a master class because then I'll be out of business. But go ahead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I probably won't be doing a specific master class. Yes. Only because, yeah. <laughs> only because literally, um, like right now, um, um, we have time as we all do, right? And I want to stay productive and connect to the community this way, which I think is really amazing. And I love having this opportunity. But um, I'd say my day to day life doesn't usually give me that time of time because I do I do have, you know, a life like a family and I do have what is that? all of my my work family, right? <laughs> yeah, <You know>? yeah. <laughs> my work family with all my cinematographer family that are out there shooting and being creative right. and directors and things. So um, you know, I could be working on several different shows and then be talking about on the phone or reading scripts or looking at lookbooks for the stuff that's coming up. So it's always kind of multitasking to, to, and then to throw something else on top of it, you know, which would be basically, you know, a masterclass of explaining all this kind of stuff. Just honestly, probably wouldn't work very well for just my life in it's, general. <laughs> it's, it's easy. Just sleep, um, you know, for two hours a night. That's what I do. I just, I, know, right? I just cut down to that. Right. Like, I'm just, like I'm sleeping for two hours. Um, I want to ask you this. Okay. So this is a personal problem. I hate watching movies in my living room on a subpar TV that is not calibrated. Like it drives me crazy. Anytime wife is just like, Hey, yep. do you want to watch this? Like, do you want to watch Parasite? And I'm like, please watch it in my office. Like everything is dialed in. Yes. <laughs> or you, does that bother you as much as it bothers me? Or you just don't care? No. Oh, it bothers me. Oh yeah. No, I definitely, what I do is I've got funny enough, like my, my iPad, my iPad pro looks amazing. So I actually 100. have it with me. Right. I love it. So I'll have it with me. And I'll look at stills on my iPad and I can look at it in my bay, one of my bays, whatever at work. And I'm like, Oh yeah, that's right. That's cool. That's good. You know? And then when I come home, I just calibrate my TVs, all of them. I've got a couple of that to, to that to basically make sure it feels right. <laughs> best this is i'm so glad it's coming from you because literally yes this is so amazing this is so amazing it's coming yeah. from you because i think that ipad pro like that's my final out like i'm just making sure my qc final qc tool is like i'm like okay it's looking this good here like we're, we'll be covered if it goes out it's gonna look pretty good yeah i mean i i do love that it's a nice tool to be able to use. i mean obviously i've got you know monitors that right. work which are like the X300s or whatever, which are crazy, amazing monitors. But uh, the general feel, you know, is really great in, on the iPad Pro. So I, I use that as a tool for sure. Do you get enough time? Um, I mean, we heard about your schedule a little bit, but do you still find time to watch TV or movies or anything like that? Sometimes, sure. Like if I, I, I like going to the theater and seeing movies from some like, amazing cinematography or whatever that I love seeing that on the big screen, you know, still love that experience. And, um, yeah, I'll find time, like, you know, I'll find time to watch stuff on TV, some shows that I've heard about, but, uh, I am, it takes me a while usually to catch up depending, you know, right. my schedule ebbs and flows. I'm catching up on some stuff now, but <laughs> know. you know, yeah. Yeah. Not, I'm... not as much as I'd like. Probably, but yeah. Same. Cause it's like, I, my wife and I both like, I mean, we're, we went to school for film, but we just never have the time to do it. So like, we're always getting educated by our brothers and like our siblings that they're just like, did you watch this? Did you watch that? It was amazing. And we were like, all right, we'll, we'll watch it. We'll check it out. But yeah, never enough yeah. time. Okay. So, um, yeah. iPhone or Android? iPhone. <laughs> there you go. Love it. Okay. So <laughs> Leo or Christian Bale? Uh, Leo. 100, right? He comes back from my childhood. I just remember him from a long time ago. Right. Um, and how are you doing with the quarantine? Are you, are you staying I'm, sane? I, I am. I'm just trying to focus all my energy into some being creative, you know, and connecting with the community and, um, you know, homeschooling kids and like trying to balance all of that. It's been actually, you know, I'm just trying to make best out of it and and you know getting to connect with my kids on that level and teaching them and seeing how their little brains work and yeah. and then you know reading more scripts and uh look 
doing more painting and, you know, taking walks, just trying to like get through it. No, I know. I, I love that too. Like I, I just pushed my son. First of all, we have a 17 year old, but I just pushed my son to start, like just start his YouTube channel. I'm like, what are you doing, dude? Like, you know, you, you kids yeah. got it easy. You go on TikTok and you make a video and you get 1 billion views and nobody wants to see my old face. Like you're, you're young, you're <laughs> hip, just go do this stuff. Yeah. So we're putting him on that. I don't know how much he loves it, but we're doing it. Um, <laughs> That's good. So, okay. Um, let's talk about, you know, so, so, you know, this phase that we're going through changed a lot, right? So like remote grading has been around forever, but now like the remote workflow and everything, do you think that after this is over, this is going to be sort of like a thing? Like this is going to be an option because I know on bigger production stuff is still sort of like a wine and dine and you have to be there and all that stuff. Like, do you think it's going to change or it's going to just go back to what it was? Well, it's going to be interesting because um, for some of the bigger productions, their, their concern I, and I, understand it clearly is is security right so they don't want oh, yeah. to have the reason why you have to wind and down be there is is because they don't want the um, images leaking out anywhere and they also want to keep all their creatives you know in the same room and make sure there's no misunderstandings on a phone call like all the just basic human communication is always best in the room so that being said i think though uh, i have been doing some streaming some stuff like some uh let's see commercials I've been streaming and I've got a Netflix show still rolling and doing umbrella Academy season two. And I can do that remotely. And, and it's been working out well for sure because I, we really have no other choice, but I think the best thing is always to be in the room. I think it does open up possibilities though. It's for people to be, you know, on the mix stage, people are super busy on a mix stage and visual effects and kind of towards the end of a timeline to be able to stream to kind of just, look and say, oh yeah, yeah, that's good. That visual effect fits in well, colored it great. Okay, cool. Done. Like that type of thing right. can really be, you know, I think in that way it might actually change for sure. Like it might be a little bit more fluid, a little bit more of an option. Right. Whereas, you know, before this whole thing, people were like, well, I have to drive across town. Or whatever. So now yeah. do you have like a, do you have a favorite genre or favorite type of stuff you want to work on? Um, that you usually pick over something else? Or do you just go with like, you read the script, you hear the story and you're like, all right, I'm in. Yeah, well, it really has a lot to do with um, the creative. So the director, cinematographer, you know, or whoever else might be bringing me in, editor. So uh, if if they really are passionate about it and really want me to be able to be a part of the project, then I'm inspired. I'm, I want to be in, you know? And so that kind of thing. I don't usually turn stuff down unless I'm really, really busy. If I'm really, really busy, um, you know, then obviously I don't want to overextend myself because that's not good for anybody. So that that's the only time I'll like say no to a project usually. And so there's always something about every project, whether it's the best script or the most beautiful lighting or something, there's always something to it that is pretty amazing. And, and um, for everything that I've been working on. So there's no real favorite genre. It's more about the team. I'm working with for sure. That's so true. I mean, and that's one thing like personally, just coming from cinematography, editing and color background, like I am drawn toward color grading because I feel like the imagery tell, like inspires me to do something, you know, whereas with editing and stuff, so much, so many times it's like a blank, blank canvas and you just have to create something. You have to put it on there in the timeline to, to start going somewhere. Whereas yeah. You know, I just got to look, I'm going to start playing with it and I'm going to see what these colors that exist in the space will do. And then like, yeah. that's going to inspire me and I'll get going. So, um, yeah. I totally agree with you. We have two minutes before we get shut down. So I just want to thank <laughs> you for myself and from everybody, uh, for taking the time to show up. And I don't yes. think we even have to tell people where to go follow you. They should know. And if they don't know, then <laughs> they, know. they don't deserve you. Um, thank you so much, Jill. Do you have anything? No, do, you have like a, do you have like, do you have like a advice for because those questions come in i mean so many questions came in but one of the questions is like you know somebody who's asked you like if somebody is starting out and they're beginners and they want to get into color grading um and we talked about it a little bit but do you have like hey do x y and z and you're going to be off to a good start do you have anything for people I don't know if I would be able to give you exactly X, Y, Z, because I kind of came up differently from everybody else. But I would say my my rule 
is always work really hard. Don't give up on anything. Put your mind to it. Just keep rolling. Keep doing it. No matter who tells you you can't. And learn as much as you can. Learn the technology. Learn the art. Learn the craft. Ask questions. Never be afraid to ask questions because I still do. Always learning every day. And that's like literally, I think, what keeps you going in this industry. That's humbling. That's like, I mean, just hearing that is so freaking amazing from you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, My pleasure. Really appreciate it. Bye. Of course. Thank you so much. Take care. This time, I'm not going to say hopefully you found it epic because I have the utmost respect for Jill and for her to take the time to have a conversation with us. I know for a fact it brought you value. Smash that like button. Subscribe to my channel for more awesomeness. Make sure to check out the link in the description for a one hour long free training. I will see you guys in the next video.